Just 70 hours or so of air left in a tourist submersible that went missing near the wreck of the Titanic. And the race is on to rescue the five on board the vessel that lost contact less than two hours into descent. And for more on that missing submarine, we are joined now by Stefan Williams, Professor of Marine Robotics at the University of Sydney. Well, thanks for joining us, Prof. Uh, firstly, help us understand what is the latest technology in robotics that rescuers are using right now while searching for uh, the missing sub? So they would use a combination of devices. So they would have um, Coast Guard vessels, for example, who, who have come to the site to use uh, acoustic systems to try and listen for any beacons. They'll have aircraft um, surveying to see if they can find the submersible if it has come up to the surface. And then they may be starting to deploy um, remotely operated vehicles, which will be able to descend down to the wreck site to help uh, assist with the search. Um, nevertheless, nevertheless I mean, with all that technology there, it's still been very hard to find this vessel, I guess with the ocean being so vast and the area remote. Mm. What about the other factors that's making this search operation yep. especially challenging? I mean, a big factor here, of course, is the depth. So the Titanic's located in approximately 3,800 metres of water, so that's 3.8 kilometres um, under the sea surface. Um, so they will have been... Uh, preparing to descend the submersible to that depth uh, to do some investigation around and, and you know, examine uh, the wreck site. Um, my understanding is that they've lost contact with the submersible after it's about an hour and 45 into what was meant to be a two-hour descent. Um, so it will be somewhere near, it will have been somewhere near the sea floor at that point. Um, acoustic communications are challenging at that kind of range and and, of course, you know, optical like light just will not penetrate in those sorts of depths. So being able to see where the where the vessel might be is is a is a real challenge. Um, you know, what they would hope to do is to maintain acoustic communications and tracking while the submersible was underway. Um, but it appears that they've lost that contact with it. And, you know, uh, Professor, just uh, before coming on, I was just looking at footage of the submersible. It's, it's, it's basically like being cramped inside a capsule, uh, you know, not for claustrophobics. But for the people yeah. inside the submersible no. right now who are fighting for their lives, what is the condition like and, and what is it going to take to survive, you know, the remaining few hours left? Well, that depends very much on what's happened in the interim. So I think the best case scenario is that they've lost communications, but that otherwise the submersible's intact and, and it's potentially coming to the surface. There will be safety devices on board to either drop weight or inflate a bag to increase the buoyancy to bring the, the vessel back up to the surface. If that's the case, then it'll be a matter of trying to find it um, using either aerial surveillance or ships on the surface. Um, Another possibility is that they've had some sort of failure of some of the onboard systems and they've ended up um, potentially descending down to the seafloor. In that, that case, they would be relying on acoustic beacons and other devices that are independent of the vehicle's main power to try and locate um, the submersible and to hopefully execute a recovery. Um, and and of you've course, just painted the, for the us. The most catastrophic potential is for a failure. Yeah. Mm, right. Um, you, no, you've, you've just painted for us uh, the best case scenario uh, just a little bit earlier, but how optimistic are you of that actually happening? I mean, given the amount of time that it's been since they've heard from it and the fact that it, it appears that they don't have any communication with the submarine, I, I'd be a little bit pessimistic. You know, I think there's a, there's a chance that there has potentially been a catastrophic failure of the pressure vessel, which is where the life support systems and where people would have been um, housed. Um, the submersible would have been subject to, you know, order 350 times atmospheric pressure. So there's a huge amount of pressure pushing down on these pressure vessels once they're in the deep sea. Um, and if there's been some sort of fault, um, then it is possible that, that the vessel would have been um, essentially destroyed. And, and, you know, that would have had um, serious um, consequences for people on board. And uh, Professor Steph, Stefan, when it comes to deep sea exploration or deep sea tourism, in terms of regulation, I'm just wondering how rigorous um, is it? And because of this latest incident, what is its impact uh, on the future 
of uh, deep sea exploration? So I think there are some regulations around operations in the high seas. So outside of um, particular maritime jurisdictions, there are, you know, regulations of how, how you operate vessels and the sorts of things you can put in and, and recover from the sea. Um, I'd say this deep sea tourism industry is relatively unregulated. It's a relatively young industry. It's something that's just coming onto the scene. Um, you know, you can look back a decade and people starting to talk about this as a possibility, but it's only becoming sort of a commercial reality over the last few years. Um, it'll be interesting to see what impact um, this has. And I, I suspect a little bit the outcome of, of what happens over the next couple of days will really dictate the conversation we have going forward about how we manage these sorts of operations and the possibility of using this as a you know, a tourism venture and, and bringing people into these um, you know, extreme environments. So we talk a lot about deep sea tourism and space tourism, and people are increasingly wanting to kind of experience firsthand these um, extreme environments. But uh, there are significant risks associated with that. Well, many thanks uh, for explaining this all to us. Uh, Stefan Williams from the University of Sydney.